So uh, we're going to continue in our series, though. If you don't know me, I'm Pastor Augie. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, we are almost done. We are so close to the end. Pastor Bob's going to finish this up next week, I believe, right? Yeah, next week, because we want to kick off a Christmas series starting December 1. And um, this series for me has um, kind of been lately like, uh, you know, like when you've got family over and they've stayed too long. Do you know what I mean? And it's like... Like me for the hall, and you're hearing the same stories over and over again. You're like, I love you, but you got to go. You know, like for me, sometimes recently, we've, we've kept hearing the kind of the same thing over and over and over again. And Bob and I are trying to be creative to say the same thing over and over again a little bit differently. Uh, today's not like that, so that's kind of good. Um, but, but we're excited to be able to kind of finish this up. It's been a long one. If you're new to Oasis, this is week 30, I believe. I wrote it down. Yeah, week 30 of our series. Let me catch you up. 30 weeks, okay, of 1 Samuel. We've been working through really quickly. Um, the nation of Israel, the Hebrews, if, we, if you want to call them, um, they were doing great. Everything was good. They had a leader. Samuel was a spiritual leader. Before that, it was Eli, and things were good, and they're looking around them. They didn't have a king. They're like, we want a king. Samuel's like, you don't want a king. Trust me. They're like, we do. No, you don't. It's like talking to a teenager. They, they think they know more than you. Um, and uh, they're like, yeah, give us a king. And so they, they, they elect, and God chooses Saul as their first king. Saul's uh, tall, dark, and handsome. Imagine the opposite of me, right? He's tall, dark, and handsome. I'm short, homely, and, you know, white. Uh, imagine the complete opposite of me. He's like, yeah, that's our man. He's a warrior. He's buff. He's all these things that I'm not. And he's good for a long time. And then he starts, like, slipping, slippery slope really bad, doing really stupid stuff. Uh, really kind of takes on some insane characteristics, so much so that he's slaughtering, murdering hundreds of priests and their families and things like that, all based on the reality that David, this new, this young man, this coming up and comer, had been anointed the next king. And God said, I'm not okay with how Saul's leading. I'm choosing a new one. And David wasn't doing anything to Saul, but Saul was jealous, and he was doing everything he could to kill David. And that went on and on and on and on and on for a lot. In 20-some chapters, we looked at David's running from Saul and Saul's pursuit of him. And then a few weeks ago, we saw David really, he was a great example for us. And then a few weeks ago, we saw him take a pretty drastic turn in strategy. And so far, God's been protecting him and guiding him and doing all these things. And David finally said, man, I'm just done. I'm tired. I'm over it. I'm just done. And so he went to go live with the Philistines, the enemy, and kind of blend in with them and try to get away from Saul because he knew Saul was so scared of the enemy Philistines that if he went there, he could stay away from Saul in the pursuit of his life. And that's that last week, we, we began to t- talk about that. Pastor Bob talked about that. They began to assemble for battle, okay? They're getting ready for battle, and Saul's freaking out because he knows he's going to get his you-know-what handed to him, right? Like, he's like, they're coming for us, and he doesn't know what to do, and so he starts doing some sketchy stuff with witches and all these things, okay? And that's where we find ourselves. David, who has been our great example warrior king, is now living with the enemy, he's behind enemy lines, and he, he's, doing, he's in rebellion at this point. He truly is in rebellion. He's not living the way he ought to be. He's lying, he's murdering people, and he has gone down this very quick, slippery slope. And we're going to see what happens here, some consequences of those actions. And uh, I pray that we can apply these things to our life as well. Hopefully that was enough of a review, 30 weeks and, you know, three minutes, I'm hoping. So we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to jump right into it. Today's message title is Identity Crisis, because that's really where we find David at this point. He doesn't know who's up, who's down, whether he is this or not. He, he's really kind of, he's strung between two things, two beliefs, two people, all of this stuff, and he is having an identity crisis. You may know someone in here that has an identity Don't point them out, right? Like you, we all kind of deal with this from time to time. I had for many years an identity crisis that I'll talk to here in a bit. But they're assembled for war. The Philistines are, are there ready to battle the Israelites, okay? And remember, David's with the Philistines right now with King Achish. Let's see where it goes. Chapter 29, we're going to pick up in verse 
1 says this, the entire Philistine army now mobilized at Aphek, and the Israelites camped at the spring in Jezreel. As the Philistine rulers were leading out their troops in groups of hundreds and thousands, David, who's an Israelite, okay? If you're new, this is crazy that this is happening. David and his men marched at the rear with King Achish. Achish is the enemy, and he's with them, and he's serving King Achish. Continuing, verse 3, but the Philistine commanders demanded, what are these Hebrews doing here? Those are Israelites. What are these Hebrews doing here? And Achish told him, this is David, the servant of King Saul of Israel. He's been with me for years, and I've never found a single fault in him from the day he arrived until today. Remember, David, David became a traitor, and he revolted, and he goes over, and he's serving with the king. Or is he? That's really the question. Is he or is he not? Let's continue. Verse 4. But the Philistine commanders were angry. Send him back to the town you've given him, they demanded. He can't go into battle with us. What if he turns against us in battle and becomes our adversary? Is there any better way for him to reconcile himself to his master than by handing our heads over to him? So they're like, you got to send him back. He can't fight with us. He's, he's part of them. He's going to turn on us mid-battle. Like, get that guy out of here. Verse 5, isn't this the same David whom the women of Israel sing in their dances? Saul has killed his thousands. And David, his tens of thousands. Six, so Achish finally summoned David and said to him, I swear by the Lord that you've been a trustworthy ally. I think you should go with me into battle, for I've never found a single flaw in you from the day you arrived until today. But the other Philistine rulers won't hear of it. Please don't upset them, but go back quietly. Verse eight. And then here's David's response. Gets all salty. What have I done to deserve this treatment, David demanded. What have you ever found in your servant that I can't go and fight the enemies of the Lord my king, of the Lord the king? But Achish insisted, as far as I'm concerned, you're as perfect as an angel of God. But the Philistine commanders are afraid to have you with them in the battle. Now get up early in the morning. Sorry, here we go, verse 10. Now get up early in the morning and leave with your men as soon as it gets light. So David and his men headed back into the land of the Philistines while the Philistine army went out to Jezreel. That's our chapter. That's it. So I always ask you this every week. What stood out to you? Just want to hear, like, as you read that, what are some things that pop into your brain? We ask this every week, and I'll be interested to see. Yeah, what's up? Yeah, did he call him his king? Right? He said, my lord, the king, right? We're going to ask a question about that. Who was he, what king was, what lord was he referring to? Achish or Saul? We're going to ask that question. Yeah, that, that's an important one. What else? Yeah, Terry. Yeah, so she said... Uh, for those listening online, that he didn't ask for a way out, but God provided a way out. So that way he didn't have to battle his own people or make that choice. Uh, and remember, David was constantly, previous to this, asking God, what should I do? What should I, what should I do? And remember, two weeks ago, he didn't ask God about where he should go. He just went, right? And now God's he's, he's protecting him from that. He's saving him from this horrible thing that he might have to do. What else stands out to you? Yeah, ask who. The Philistine, yeah. The Philistine others were afraid. You mean the commanders? Yeah. So the other commanders were afraid, but Achish wasn't, right? Achish was like, come on, you're my bodyguard. Remember he, last week he called him, you're my bodyguard for life. What else? Yeah, Dave. It's interesting. He, David said, it, what, what, we know the rest of the story because we know the rest of this as we read it. But David is now willing to go to war against his countrymen. Yeah, Bob. How do we know he didn't have the perfect flanking position, right? The Philistine commanders were smart enough. They were wise. 
I think Ach- Let, let's talk about, I want to talk about a few of those things. I, I really believe that Achish was blindly trusting David, right? He blindly trusts him. We talked about this two weeks ago that he didn't even check up on David, right? He never even checked up on who David was murdering. David was murdering his allies, but David was telling him that he was murdering his fellow countrymen, never even looked into it, right? That, that Achish just blindly trusts him with his life. We saw this last week. Look at this in chapter 28. About that time, the Philistine mustered their armies for another war with Israel. King Achish told David, you and your men will be expected to join me in battle. And David says, very well. Now you will see for yourself what we can do. Then, David, then, then Achish told David, I will make you my personal bodyguard for life. That Achish just believes him. He trusts him. He, and even this week, what did he say? Achish insisted, as far as I'm concerned, you're as perfect as an angel of God. Is David acting perfectly towards Achish? He's absolutely not, right? He's straight up murdering his allies and lying to him right to his face about it, right? David has been lying to Achish this whole time, and Achish doesn't see it. He absolutely doesn't see it. He just sees what he wants to see. Should Achish be trusting David at this point? Probably not, okay? Probably not. The, the next thing, next point that, that I want to make is the Philistine, which somebody said, the Philistine generals didn't trust David, did they? They're like, no way, bro, you're not going with us, right? And they were wise for that. It's very wise not to let an enemy traitor serve with you, right? They're like, he's going to turn on us. There's no way he can go to battle with us. He's going to turn on us. So let's not even give him the chance to. Look what it says there, verse 4. But the Philistine commanders were angry. Send him back to the town you've given him, they demanded. He can't go into battle with us. What if he turns against us and becomes our adversary? Is there any better way for him to reconcile himself to his master than by handing our heads over to him? Now, this was not a random thought. This had previously happened. We already read about this in chapter 14. Look at it right here. Chapter 14, this exact thing happened between the Israelites and the Philistines. Some of the Hebrews, some of the Israelites had had gone and served with the Philistines, living with the Philistines, fighting with the Philistines. And look what it says there. Even the Hebrews, this is chapter 14, verse 21. Even the Hebrews who had previously gone over to the Philistine army revolted and joined in with Saul and Jonathan. And this had already happened. So they're like, we're not letting this happen again, right? They were actually pretty wise. And then the the third point that I want to make of this in, in this identity crisis idea is that David is really playing both sides. He's trying his best to play both sides here. And he's do, uh, so far he's doing a really, really good job. Look what it says there in verse 8. But what have I done to deserve this treatment? I have to ask, is he serious or is he acting, right? Like I have so many questions that I, I want for us to work through this morning um, together and in groups and by yourself. Um, is he acting like David demanded, what have I ever, what have you ever found in your servant that I can't go and fight the enemies of the, of my Lord, the King? Do you think David's really upset about not being able to go and fight? Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. It depends how you read this text. Has he really fallen so far that he is ready to kill his countrymen or is he playing that way? Is he acting that way? He's really absolutely playing both sides of this. He's excited to go into battle. Maybe that's true. And he says, you'll see what we can do. Maybe that's true because he's either going to slaughter his brothers or he's going to slaughter Achish. We don't know. Like we, we absolutely don't know. And it's bugging me. It's really, really bugging me that I don't get to find out what happens here in this account. Verse 28, or chapter 28, verse 1 and 2, look at what David says. Now you'll see for yourself what we can do. That's vague. David has been vague with Achish, constantly vague about all of these things. He's playing both sides, the enemy and his brothers 
and sisters. There's so many questions that this account brings up in my mind, like so many questions. And here's, here's some of the questions that, that I began thinking through this week. And I, like, I don't have any answers to these, to be honest. Um, so here, here's what I, here's what I, I want to try something this morning. We'll see how this works. I know some of you are freaking out right now because I'm trying something new. Um, if you're one of those people, just do this by yourself, okay? But with the few people around you, and I know already you're like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not talking to anybody. If you're that way, just keep your head down, look at your phone, go get a drink, go to the bathroom. This is a good break. Um, but with the people around you, the one or two, maybe you came with someone or, you know, like the four up here or the six over here or the ten over here. I want for us to kind of talk about these questions. What do you think? Like the first one, should, should King Achish trust David? Should he or should he not? What do you think? Like, I want for you guys to work through this. Was David a trustworthy bodyguard for Achish? Do you think he would have saved his life in battle? It, yes or no? Someone's saying no, some are saying yes, because they, they believe that he really loved Achish. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to, best you can, turn to the people that are around you and take a few minutes and work through these questions. I want you to discuss what your take is on all this, because we've been studying this for 30 weeks. We've been looking at David's life for a long time now. I want you, we're just going to take a few minutes. I'm going to see, and I know if you're one of those solo people, you don't want to look at anybody, just do it on your own. That's fine. There is no pressure. But let's talk about this, okay? Amongst yourselves, let's talk for a few minutes, and then we're going to come back to it. All right, y'all. It's really good to hear all that talk. All that chatter. I'm praying that it was about this and not the. It wasn't about lunch. No. Yeah, whether well, where are we going to lunch? Um, just yeah, I'm just curious. How many of you like y'all had a, a good debate? Like some of you were on one side. Like some of you were like, ooh. Anyone have? Did did everyone agree? Everyone agreed here. Well, somebody tell somebody tell me a, like a one or two sentence review of what you guys de decided in your little group. Anybody? I know it's kind of weird. Now I'm asking you to speak publicly or whatever. And I, I listen. I appreciate those of you who you just hated every single second of that. Okay, because that's me. Uh, that's my personality. I don't want to talk to anybody. I just leave me alone in my little chair. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to do my thing. Um, so I appreciate, yeah, Don. So we decided that the uh, commander knew that David had secretly been uh, trusting the, the servants there. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, they, they knew he wasn't really. Yeah. Sure, yeah, especially from the rear. Yeah. How many of you believe that David really was, was just so far in rebellion that he was ready to kill his countrymen? How many of you think that? There's some of you, right? Some think that. How many of you think he was just playing, he was acting, and there's no way in battle that, okay, how many of you believe that in battle he would have turned on the Philistines? Yeah. How many of you believe that he would have fought his countrymen even though he didn't want to, to save his own life? Yeah, yeah so there, there's, yeah, like, we don't know, right? We're not sure. Um, and his, like, his mindset really changes how, the, the way I read it, right? And so you, you kind of got to go through both sides of it and I, I struggled this week try, figuring out like how are we going to work through this like what's redeemable about all this I think what what Terry brought up is that God's always going to provide a way out we talked about that before first Corinthians 10 13 no temptation to seize you is what except what is common to man but God's faith he'll provide a way out for you so that way you can 
you don't have to, that, that, that verse. Um, but this is, that's kind of really doesn't apply here. Um, but that God is always faithful. He's going to provide a way out for us. That's good. Um, but would David have taken it? You know, what, what would he have done? Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah, if you didn't hear her, she said, he, we just find out, especially from last week, the week before, that David's just in desperation mode. And he's just trying to survive. And we all find ourselves there probably at some point where you think I would never, ever do that. And we say I would never, ever do that. And then we find ourselves in a situation and sometimes we're doing things that we never in a million years would have imagined. And I think that's what's relatable to King David. Is that God said, this is a man after my own heart. And he was a great king. But he had his issues, right? We, find, we don't know this yet. I mean, we, we find out much later in the story, the continuation of this. We find out that David was a great king, but also has some serious trips in his life. Some serious hang-ups. And uh, it's relatable to us. Because I feel like we all have those things. And, and what, what's, I guess what's com almost comforting to me is that if even the best of the best of the best gets caught up in rebellion and sin, right, we better be careful, right? We better be careful. We better watch what we're doing. We better, we better always be on guard for that stuff to sneak up in us. And that's what I want to talk about just really quick, um, this identity crisis um, that he's going through. And I, I made an acronym for it, for the word crisis. Um, and if you're feeling a blank kind of person, that, that's, we've got those things there for you. But um, I really believe that he was in a, an identity crisis, that he, you know, he was up, down, sideways, back and forth. He was all over the place, and he didn't know where he was, and he was, he was caught up far from God. Um, if you've heard my story, and many of you have, I, I mean, I can totally relate to the identity crisis illustration. Um, I'm going to share my story again. Some of you are like, oh, again, right? But I know some of you don't know it, and uh, the, re the like, my story is really David's here. I grew up going to church every week, like every week. My mom in the back, the uh, blonde-haired lady back there, every week we were at that church. I'm not going to lie to you, man. I'm, you know, bring your Bible, fill out the little envelope, said Bible read daily, right? Bring, you remember those envelopes where you'd make the check mark, literally check marking things? Um, church every Wednesday, growing up, did RAs. Y'all remember RAs? How many of you remember RAs and GAs? Yeah, you guys are old school Southern Baptists. That's cool. RAs and GAs, some of you are like, what is he talking about? That's how old school my faith is, right? Uh, or was it really faith is, is the true question. I was going to church, doing the things, wearing the t-shirt, knowing all the answers, looking the part of a Christian, but the reality was I was what Jesus described the Pharisees as, a whitewashed tomb that looks beautiful on the outside, but is full of dead men's bones on the inside. That was me for 25 years. I did the Christian thing. I did the church thing. I did the religion thing. I looked the part. I even knew some of the hymn numbers. You know what I mean? Like where you know your favorite one is just as I am. That's 182. Like I knew all that stuff. And the reality was on the inside, I was just a horrible piece of trash. I was not a repentant believer in Jesus. I played the part on a Sunday morning, Monday morning go to school, and I acted and did and said all of the other things that all of the other kids did, 
all the way through Saturday night. That went through college and my early career and the Border Patrol, and I chased women, and I did all those things. I went out partying on, to the bars on Friday nights and Saturday nights, but you better believe my butt was in church on Sunday morning because that's what you do, right? It's just how you're raised. I was not a believer in Jesus. I was a believer on paper, maybe. I was a member of a church, but I was not a believer in Jesus. It didn't change my life one bit, 99.9% of the rest of my life. The 1% of my life that I was sitting in church, I looked the part, but I really wasn't. And I lived that way for a long time until this beautiful woman came to me and said, you're an idiot. <laughs> and she's sitting over there, and we were engaged, and she said, I'm not marrying a fake. And that crushed me, and it, that was like my moment where I realized I'd been faking it, faking it, faking it, just like David is here, faking it, faking it for years and years and years. And I couldn't do it anymore. I knew I was about to lose the woman that I was destined to be with and all that. And I went to my pastor at the time and I just bawl, you know, like the snot and everything, like bawling, tears and, oh, you know, that cry, the horrible, horrible, gut-wrenching cry. And I told him, I'm in line to you. I'm really just an idiot. I do all these things. I just broke it all down. No, you know, no holds barred. And I let him know who I really was. And I said, I know that I need Jesus, I, I, and I know that I need to ask him into my heart, and I don't know what's holding me. He goes, let's do it right now, man. And I'm like, all right, let's go. And, and I asked Jesus to forgive me of my sin, forgive me of all that living apart from him for so many years. I repented of that sin. I turned my life away from those things that I was doing, and I invited the Holy Spirit to, to change me and mold me. And he did at that point, about 25 years of age. And since then, I've been living for him in a true way. Uh, but that was my identity crisis. And I wonder if there's not some people here today that can identify with who I was. That just come here and you got the Oasis t-shirt and that's all good. But really, it's just a shirt, y'all. What's your heart like? What is your heart like? That's my question to you today. And we have to question David's heart here. And I, I don't know where we stand with David at this point, more importantly, where do you stand with God? Are you faking it like he was? Are you faking it like I was? Where's your heart really? Does it really belong to Jesus? And when I was in an identity crisis, I had to do some things, and you have to do some things, and David had to do some things, and these are your fill in the blanks. So I just want to work you through really quick this acronym that I came up. To just talk about, like if you identify with me, if you identify with where David was, here's the answer, okay? If you're in an identity crisis like David, here's what you got to do. And you know these things already, right? You got to confess your sin. That's taking yourself, your problems, your issues, all of, this stuff, all of the junk, and going to the Lord and saying, God, I, I, I'm... I'm laying this all out there. Like, he already knows it all anyway. To confess your sin is to, to verbalize it, to agree with God is what that really means, to agree with God about who you are. You say, God, I'm sorry for the way that I lived. I'm sorry for the sin that I've committed. I ask you to forgive me. I confess that to you. Confession is an absolute important, the very first part, the very first place we have to go in turning away from that rebellion is to God in confession. We've got to confess. You're not going to get very far on your own, okay? You're just not. The very first place is the Lord. Sell, you can go buy self-help books from Barnes & Noble, and they're going to do a little bit of help for you, and you'll be right back at the same place until you confess your sin before God. This, the next step is to repent of your sin. That's, that's a weird word, repent, is just real simple. Repent is to turn around. That's it. You're going one direction. You're going in rebellion to God. And you just repent is to turn around. If you're a skateboarder, that's a 180. Okay? 180 degrees. That's it. You're turning away. That means the things that you were doing, you don't do anymore. That may mean having to break up with someone. That may mean having to get a new job. 
That may mean you need to have some really hard conversations with people and say, I can't live that way anymore. Okay, I got to turn away from that. Whatever those temptations were in your life, you got to turn away from those things. You got to make some major changes. And then number or letter I is you've got to involve the Holy Spirit. Listen, self-help books, you can ask for Jesus to forgive you and he will absolutely, you can turn away from your sin. But unless you ask the Holy Spirit to do a new work in you, it's likely just going to be you trying really hard. And we're not very good at trying very hard. It's just the reality. We fall back into sin and temptation constantly if we have not asked the Holy Spirit. And for some of you, like me, 25 years of rebellion, I ain't doing that on my own, okay? I ain't getting out of that on my own. It's going to have to be the Holy Spirit that does a new work in me. And I think if you would talk to my bride, you would tell her that the Holy Spirit did some pretty incredible things uh, in me in a few years uh, because there's no reason why I I ought to be up here. Absolutely no reason why I to be up here teaching people about the word. But it's only because of what the Holy Spirit has done in my life. He's going to give you the power to stand versus temptation. The next one may be a little bit um, odd for you. You need to secure help from others. And what I mean by that is like um, we need people um, that can come alongside us, right? And can, can help us, accountability partners, um, and for instance, like I'm on a no carb diet, right? And, uh, last night I had some carbs. We had this, uh, we had this little party at our house, right? And if I'm on a no carb diet, should I be holding the bag of donuts? Right? You need somebody to, you need a, right? That's good. We all need a donut slapper. <laughs> right? That's, all, that's only on the ground for a little bit. I could probably get it. <laughs> no. L- listen, no, seriously, we all need a donut slapper, don't we? That yes, the Holy Spirit does a work in us, but we also need... We need to secure help from others, people that can come alongside us that we can tell them, I'm trying not to eat carbs, right? I'm trying not to eat carbs. So when you go out to lunch together and, you know, they're like, dude, what are you ordering, right? Uh, If you're on a diet or you let them know about your sin issue and you're like, listen, I'm really not trying to punch people in the face anymore. Do you know what I mean? And so they're going to help you not punch people in the face anymore. We need those donut slappers in our life to help hold us accountable. We all need donut slappers, okay? And thank you. She's gone. She, like, literally took off. Uh, We need donut slappers, so secure help from others. Um, We need to implement a new plan. This is what I mean by that. Listen, focusing on not sinning. So many of us say, well, I'm just going to stop sinning. I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to stop doing that. Um, We focus so much on it that... It's, it's all we focus on, right? And we end up just doing it again, right? We need a new plan. We need a new... Most of us, when we're trying to come away from something, we automatically replace that with something else. And so many times we replace it with bad stuff, okay? So many, so many times we replace those things that we're trying to get away from with bad stuff. We need to replace those donuts with carrots, I guess. You know what I mean? Like, we, you, got it. you got to find a plan to replace the bad with something good. You need to implement that plan in your life. I shouldn't be thinking about donuts, even though it's right there, right? I need to replace those things. So you need to throw those things away. Most times we quit one habit and start another. Make sure that habit that you're starting is a good habit. Um, and then the last one is safeguard the strategy. Safeguard the strategy. What do I mean by that? I talked about that a few weeks ago. We need really wide guardrails in our life. If this is the thing, this is the sin, this is the thing that I don't want to do, too many of us walk right here on the line, right along the edge, right? We need some really wide guardrails in our life 
that prevent us from even getting there. Okay? So if we were to fall, you're still not in sin. Establishing wide guardrails and safeguarding our strategy with, listen to me, and this, this, this might, you might not like this and might not even agree with this, with strong and painful consequences. This is what I'm, you need to implement strong and painful consequences in your life when you are in rebellion and trying to get away from sin. Let me explain that. Some of you probably had a swear jar in your house, right? Every time I swear, I got to put a quarter in that jar or whatever, and I'm trying to stop swearing, so I'm going to put a quarter in the jar every time. No, put a 20 in the jar every time you, every time you swear. Why? Because you're going to be like, oh, what? And you're thinking, 20 bucks? It's not worth it. It's not worth it, right? It's not worth it. It's, a, it's not worth it, is it? And you, you store up all those $20 bills, and then you put it to our new building fund when you're done, right? <laughs> the reality is, I've had so many young men, older men, couples come. Both Bob and I have had couples, men, come to us describing a pornography problem, talking about a pornography problem. You know what my, my, my solution to them is? We're going to put some guardrails in your life to where the next time that you look at porn, we're literally going to smash your computer. Why? Because it hurts their pocketbook, right? It's interesting to me that when we think about this, that a lot of time the pain and consequences that come from things the one that hurts us the most is our wallet, right? Or let's say it's a work computer. Okay, next time you look at porn, you're going to donate $500 to Crossroads Mission, right? <laughs> Why? Because the next time you are tempted by that, you're like, is this worth 500 bucks? It's not, right? It's not. It's absolutely not. And we have to put safeguards in our life to sin and temptation. And unfortunately for most of us, it, has, it, it many times surrounds itself around where our heart is. And for many of us, that's our pocketbook. Um, worship team, you guys can come forward. I'm just going to get this donut off my <sighs> iPad. I didn't eat it. Some will, listen, as, as I close, some are going to say, man, you're... you're you're out of line. That's way too extreme. Sin is extreme, isn't it? Some of you, it's unrealistic. Ah, it's absolutely not. It's absolutely not. And I talked about cursing and porn. There's probably 60 or 70 other different sins that are happening in your life right here that I ain't even talking about. That each of us has to deal with in our own way apply some serious, painful consequences to those things because most of us do not learn unless there's consequences, right? That's why you ground your kids, right? That's why you take away their iPhone because there's consequences. We have to set some consequences in our life as well. Um, the reality is, is that the crisis, this, this, this acronym here, if we take our power plus the Holy Spirit power, plus accountability, plus a plan, plus consequences, I really believe that we'll see change in our life. Okay? I really believe that that identity crisis that you may find yourself in will be radically reversed as we trust the Holy Spirit to work. Let's pray.